uh, funded entrepreneurs panel, and uh, you know, getting started here. It's uh, a little early in the morning. Lots of uh, lots of exciting stuff was going on last night. So, <laughs> we have Peter uh, Vesnes from Coin Lab. Uh, we have got uh, Fred from Coinbase. Uh, it's a lot of coins and bits in here. So uh, if I get tripped up, Tony from BitPay, <laughs> Charlie from BitInstant, and uh, you know, on this panel, we're going to talk about sort of the the joys and challenges of uh, having been one of the few companies that have uh, been funded by venture capitalists in, uh, in the Bitcoin world. And what, what are some of the challenges, Peter? I don't know if challenges is the right word. I mean, this industry is booming, baby. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a very good time. Like, all of you should get a startup deck together and go see some angel investors. And you'll learn a lot doing that. What um, about personnel? I mean, it's got to be hi hard to hire and get the right people, um, you know, in a, on the fly. Oh, yeah, like if in a fast growth mode, you're yeah. saying? Yeah, uh, um, so probably all of us, we're all hiring, is that true? Yes. 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 Come talk to us. <laughs> Come talk um, to me. You know, I... <laughs> Charlie is without Only a doubt the, the best man on the panel. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I, I guess it's just what you want to talk about, but growth is... Um, growth is always hard. You got to do a good job. Make sure you've got the right culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fred, anything else? Yeah. Uh, again, I would say challenges. Well, hopefully you can avoid a lot of them by having the right people on board who are philosophically aligned with you. I think um, you know Bitcoin has obviously received a lot of media attention uh, over the last two three months. Uh, so at least for us, it was important that we had people who we really felt like um, weren't jumping into the top, so to speak, and uh, and guys who were really on board for the long haul. What's, and that, this, what's this philosophy you're talking about? So, so Fred Wilson led our round at Union Square, and he's sort of been writing about Bitcoin for two years, and in my opinion, probably the, um, the first real high-profile uh, VC guy to publicly mm -hmm. endorse is probably too strong of a word, but um, to, really, to really get behind it and see a lot of the power behind it. I think we could say he's endorsed it now. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yes. So, so and now endorsed, sure. <laughs> he's um, been endorsing it for like two years. Well, yeah, well. With a big check now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, which, you know, definitely makes... Um, and I hope the same is true. I'm assuming it is for you guys as well. It really makes your job as an entrepreneur much easier when you have somebody that's fully on board with what you're doing and 100% behind you. Mm -hmm. Tony, your, uh, your business is really out there in front. You're, you're dealing with businesses on a day-to-day -day basis, and you've got a lot of business coming in. How are you dealing with the challenges of, of more business? Because, I mean, these are good challenges to have, but they're challenges nonetheless. Sure. So we do have that problem. Um, <laughs> we're going to call it a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, so right now we're trying to make, <clears throat> we're trying to get the right employees in the right position, right? And we're trying to give the employees that we have the tools they need to be the most efficient at their job. So we've gone from two employees to 10 in about a month and a half. And we have Jeez. our core team. And I'm really proud of our core team. I think every single one of them is here. And the job of everybody that we have right now is to focus on building the tools that we need for the next 30 people to do their jobs. Mm. And so when you're starting to, to figure out, you know, how That's do you scale point. up a company in a, in a high growth area, you know, you got to start with your core team. If you have turnover um, in your core team, then it's just going to kill you and kill your momentum. What do you do to solidify your core team? Well, we bring them all out to events like this, and they're all excited to just see the energy of Bitcoin. And it bond you know, through suffering. Yeah. Bond through shock through pain. Shock collars. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> booth duty is bonding. <laughs> Charlie, I mean, it's, you're the fastest, safest, easiest way to get Bitcoins uh, is, is your, your, your line there, and a lot of people doing business. What is it? I mean, you know, there's, it, it's hard to get Bitcoins to deliver sometimes, right? It's been, it's been an interesting ride. Thank you so much. It's been an interesting ride Charlie so Charlie is an important man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's awesome. my apple? Lindsay? Awesome. <laughs> I was up coding. <laughs> <laughs> the lies begin. <laughs> um, it's been an interesting ride because I think a lot of us, uh, at least myself, um, this is my second startup. And my first startup, it's like we didn't really raise money. We kind of started under the umbrella. So... As I'm on the phone with like VCs and they're spewing out all these Series A, all these different lingo words, I'm like Googling what these things are because mm -hmm. I have no idea what's going on. So it's like I'm, I'm learning as I'm going. Um, at the same time, I didn't want to get just like any other investor because in the beginning there, there, were, there was no money um, in, in the Bitcoin space. No, no investors were looking at it. It was really, really, really hard to raise money. 
um, and Tony knows a lot, a lot of this as well. I literally had to get the first ten thousand dollars from my mother to start Bit Instant. Um, but now it's just, it's just really crazy. So when, and I tell this to any startup, especially in the Bitcoin space, is that when, when there's so much money coming at you, take a day or two and think about who you want to take money from. I've been mm -hmm. super fortunate that my investors have not, have not only been veterans in the payment space for over 10 years, but at the same time taught me personally how to become an adult, how to communicate better, how to work with them. It's, it's kind of like a marriage on steroids. <laughs> and I'm not married. Well, that's longer than many marriages. <laughs> that cap table is hard to unwind. Yeah. So my, how much interest is mom charging you? <laughs> she, she got equity and like, it's crazy. <laughs> hey, can I, I'm curious, who's, I just want to know who we're talking to because um, I'm curious, like who here wants to be funded or has got a company and wants to get funded? Okay. Wow. So you guys, who here are investors? You guys should all hug. That would be good. Okay. So all right. let me ask you this. I mean, there has to be sort of putting putting this this stuff together. I mean, I, if somebody was offering me big money, I'd be like, "What's the catch? Yeah. What do you have to watch for in this circumstance? And what, as a as a from the VC side, what do you have to look for? And, yeah. and from the the, the funder so, side? So yeah, maybe just some basics in the venture. You guys who are investors can nod or boo or whatever. But just a lot. I've talked to a lot of guys who want to get some money in the door, right? And it, uh, one thing, when you're starting in this space, you're going to be talking to seed and angel investors when you're starting. And um, venture pitches are probably, you're, just, you're going to need to show a bunch of progress and have some, a good team and a bunch of stuff worked out before you go raise a Series A. So uh, angel investors are great. Uh, well, I, define I that for me. So an angel yeah, I was just going to say define them. Yeah, so when you talk to an angel investor, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people start like Charlie did, friends and family, some money in, then you get your angels, then you get your Series A. And an angel's going to put in fifty to $250,000, depending on how rich they are and how much they want to spread their bets out. They're going to, um, in, the, in the valley at least, they're going to loan you that money and off, very often and say, when we figure out what your company's worth, I'll, I'll get that paid back, but with a discount. So it's called a discount. What's a discount? Um, so... Uh, Extra money. So, um, do you want to talk how term sheets work? Is that useful? <laughs> I don't know, I don't Essentially, know. they would be getting more equity than a newer investor so, coming in. Like, say, say okay. Mark, I want they to gave you the money earlier. On. Okay. So, I'll give you a hundred grand, um, and when you raise money, whatever that price is, I'll get to turn my hundred grand into stock. But here's the deal: I'm, I'm here early. And those guys are going to take different kind of risks. So, I, I need to hedge it two ways. I want a 20 percent discount on whatever the, the price the next investors pay. And I'm not going to pay more than $3 million for, that, for your company, no matter what you raise at. So that's called a discount and a cap. And terms like those are very, very common for, for angel. Convertible angel notes, things yeah, like that's that. That's called a convertible yeah. note, yeah. Um, and the Series A? Series A, you, when your angels will help you work out your Series A. Okay. Um, the, but rem like you have to remember, all, all investors here, angel investors, are looking for like highly scalable growth curves. They want to understand your, your, your model and make sure that it scales and can make great money. So I've heard some people on the floor saying, like, I have an opportunity that could make like $4 million, and investors will be like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, what they want to know is that you can achieve some great, you know, uh, compounding return with you know less and less person per per dollar that you're earning over time, and that's kind of how you guys should be thinking and focusing in on, on your business models. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would encourage entrepreneurs out there to um, to really try to focus on the product as much as possible. I think it's very easy, uh, especially in the early days where you have very little manpower to uh, to get wrapped up in taking a bunch of meetings and uh, speaking with a bunch of people. The reality is, at the end of the day, you have to make a product totally. that people want to use. Um, and that's definitely been a challenge for us, admittedly, given that our team is still relatively small. We've got three full-time, three, uh, three contractors at the moment, um, which is a little strange given, given the amount of capital we've raised. But, I mean, even, even our capital raising processes, um, I think, have been, you know, a bit, on a personal level, frustrating. Um, Stressful, no? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, that, that part has actually, thankfully, been, been okay for us. Um, I think the part that is actually more stressful and, and sort of what I'm trying to get at is, you know, you are looking at the dashboard of your company every day and you want to see continued growth every day. Um, and sort of as you're going through the fundraising process, inevitably that um, takes time and resources away from actually 
doing what you, in the long run, should be doing, which mm -hmm. is building out a successful company. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just encourage people out there to try to not over-optimize mm -hmm. on, uh, on actually raising the money and just mm -hmm. build something that people want to use. I, actually, that's really good advice. And when we, we, we were the first ones to raise like a big name VC money, it was, in a, it was in a seed round, small round. And we had like our pitch that was acceptable to venture guys and then really what we wanted to do. And if I could go back, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, because we wasted a bunch of time being like, oh, if Bitcoin goes down, we'll do this and that. And the reality is like internally in the company, we spent our first few months like hedging against Bitcoin risk rather than, and it's like, no, the company is intended to be long Bitcoin. Like, like investors don't like that. They're the wrong investors for you, you know? Um, and so I think it's just, it's so important to focus on the actual company goals. Yeah, I would agree with that 1000% with what Fred said. It's you really, really, it's so easy to get wrapped up in all the hype of all the press and all of, um, uh, the meetings and everyone who wants to talk to you, people come out of the woodwork just they want to see what's going on. Um, which is one of the reasons my investors didn't, we didn't even announce it for six months. We just announced it two days ago, but the investment happened back in the fall because we needed to make sure that all our ducks were in a row, our, our team size scale is scalable. I mean, we're, we're going to be 16 to 18 people in a few weeks, uh, next week, sorry. And personally, like, I hated that in the beginning because I wanted to, to kind of like show that we did raise money and that. Mm -hmm all of that, but at the same time, I think it was the best decision that, the hardest decision that I've had to make, but at the same time, like, they were 1,000% correct, and we were able to get more products out the door and things like that, so. Tony, um, you know, you've been silent during this. I just, uh, w what are your thoughts on, the, uh, you know, the, the whole VC process? You know, I, I, Fred brought up a really good point, is that you, you don't want to underestimate the amount of time that you have to spend raising money, and every hour that you spend working on the term sheets and the lawyers and the documents and the cap table and, and the banks, it's an hour that you're not spending running your business, right. which is really, as a small team, what you need to be focused on. And these so hours, so your, so your customer support will suffer and, you, and your R&D will suffer while you take the time to raise money. You can get an investor say, let's see how traction goes. And you're like, oh shit, I spent all my time <laughs> fundraising. I have no more traction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. That's a big problem. A lot of startups <laughs> fail from that. Yeah, yeah it is. You get, you get so wrapped up in the details. And, and if, you, if you have not been through, you know, the gauntlet before, you do want to read every document and make sure you understand, mm -hmm. you know, what the risks are to what you're signing. Mm -hmm. And so it does take some time as well. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, we may be a little bit different than some of the other companies in that we started two years ago. Um, Steve and I self-funded the company for the first 18 months mm -hmm. out of our own pocket. And we had a working product, we had customers, we had revenue. And then it was only in January where we, uh, we raised a seed round. Mm -hmm. And we put that money to, to work. And it seems like every month we would end the month with more money than we started with. So we're already self-sustaining. And, you know, that was a good thing to do. You know, we may not have needed any more capital and except, you know, people that came knocking on our door where we didn't want to refuse them. Yeah. But the money well, needs to grow scale. Faster I mean, that's, yeah. that's why investors don't want to put money into a company that needs help starting up and all this. Investors want to put money into a company that is going to use this to make more money. Yeah. So if you're already making money and you say, hey, we need to raise a million dollars because we want to go after this or we want to go after a new country or go global. We want to get this license or go, and you form a budget, for sure, they want to give you money to do that because you've already proven yourself, like you said, by self-sustaining the company. And that's why it's a lot better to do that. I, I hated doing that at the same time, but I felt like in hindsight, you're able to get better terms because when you go to an investor and you don't need the money, um, it's, like, it's like dating. You have to play hard to get. It's a whole, it's a whole to do. <laughs> I, you I, date different than I do. Dating tips from Charlie <laughs> afterwards. Oh, just, just, just to temper that a little bit, I, I'm not so sure I completely agree with that, especially given where sort of Bitcoin is and what investors would hope uh, investing in the space is its actual growth trajectory. It's amazing that you guys are already self-sustaining. I, I applaud you for that. Um, but at the same time, I mean, if you look at large tech companies that have developed, look at you know Facebook or Twitter, whoever, these guys, um, I, well, PayPal, I guess might be the most relevant example here where they weren't cash flow positive for a very long time and they've obviously had a very successful um, history now. Um, but I think you can't, if you're a first time entrepreneur, I don't think you want to start with a like six year negative run rate business plan. Sure. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, it takes more coordination. There's like, no question about that. But th that being said, like, I think it, it would be unreasonable to expect that the proper strategy for, for BitPay, I think it, it could certainly make sense. Um, but for, for most companies, I'm not sure it's, 
it, it's a reasonable expectation that you're going to be cash yeah, flow positive but, but right away. What, one thing you have to also consider is that you know the valuation of your company when you raise money is going to be a lot higher the farther along you are, right? Yeah. If you have a working product, you're going to be worth a lot more than if you just have a business plan on paper. Yeah. And if you actually have revenue and customers, you're going to be worth even more. So there's all different types. You know, some investors like to you know, just go ahead and start funding a business plan and say, yeah, put a team to work and, and get a working prototype. Other investors prefer to wait until the prototype is done. And so you, know, you have different people that are you know, more skilled at different parts of the, of the, of the sure. uh, investment structure, right? And, and the, the highest risk is always the, the money that comes in first because you, know, you, you obviously don't know if, if, if it's even going to work. Of course. It's a case-by-case -case basis, though. You can't say one or the other. It's really every startup is different. But maybe in the, in the Bitcoin space, because things are moving so fast, yeah. I kind of am leaning more. To, I, I did it the way Tony did it, but I would have preferred to have had money in the beginning a lot more, be able to run with it even to be negative, just speed, because you need to get a to product off, right off now the ground. You just gotta, Bitcoin matters. What? Yeah, speed matters right now. You just got to go. You got to get, yeah. you know, get out the ground running and just go and try things out. I mean, that's, that's the only way to do it. So the speed comes at a cost, it would seem. I mean, each one of you guys um, started your company, and you started it in a bedroom with a computer or something like that. And Still you said in my bedroom. <laughs> and you said to yourself, this is what the vision I have for my company. And I wonder to myself, has the, has the money and the speed, how much has the vision changed for you? And what do you think about that? Peter, I mean, like, what, was, what was it you planned and what is it today and what, um, is it better or worse? Well, I mean, we, we've just gotten more and more ambitious as the, our sense of how big Bitcoin is grows. We're like, this is awesome. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> uh, and let's keep, like, how can we help this happen? Like, how can we be friends with people on this panel? How can we just get together as an industry? So um, I think you've, like, talked a lot about, oh, why should I take money? I mean, I think the reality is, the, the reality is, you know, I have time and attention from people who are much smarter than me mm -hmm. and, and much more experienced than me. And, and, they, and also, like, if they do a good job with me, they'll get paid for it, like, very lucratively with their stock. And so I, I actually think of any fundraising you're doing as, like, buying attention from, like, the rich people that, that are successful and that you mm -hmm. want. And my, my bet with that is, like, um, you dilute out 10%, and it, will this incredible person get you 20 30 40%, 50 100% returns? Mm -hmm. And then, like, that's, that's a very easy decision, right? Um, so that's one mindset. That's the get rich and bring people along mindset. And then there's a, there's a control mindset, and that mindset, I've run businesses with that mindset before. You don't tend to bring those people in. You, you keep it tight. But there's so much to do. And I, I, you know, the right move here is bring in as many smart investors as you can. That's what I would say. The amazing thing about the Bitcoin space, though, is that when you have a great team, especially in, in, in one of our Bitcoin companies, we don't have to like motivate them as much because we're all kind of self-motivated by Bitcoin succeeding. If we all have Bitcoins, yeah. then as long as one of our businesses succeed and make the price of Bitcoin go up. So like, I don't have to tell anyone to come late to work and things like that. I know everyone's working 24 hours a day and it's so much better to work kind of organically that way. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great way to bring out the team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and one of the, the great things I think about this experience for me at least is well, one, putting faces to names, um, mm -hmm. but two, I really feel like you know, even though we may be, well, in some senses, competitors. Um, I feel like we are really all pushing together toward, towards one vision. And hopefully, each of our successive um, fundraising announcements obviously will help, help our individual companies, but sort of the yeah. space at large. I think yeah, it was kind of, you can all kind of invest in us just by buying Bitcoins. Yeah, that's exactly. a that's weird a and cool thing about yeah. this space. Like, like it was, it was yeah. decided early on, and that's why, Peter, we started the foundation, and, and everyone who's involved in that, it was really decided early on, especially with the, with the, the one of the first, uh, in, the, the, in the early days of Bitcoin, there were very few startups, less than 10, and it was, you know, a lot of friction and competition, but we all kind of looked at each other and said, like, in our heads, let's not fight for this small pie now, let's work together, grow this pie out, and then compete later on when it's huge. <laughs> Yeah. Charlie and I have the knives ready to go. <laughs> I actually want to say... That, that's I mean, why you guys are separated, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything appropriate to say about that comment. Um, I mean, one thing I, I see is we, I talk to a lot of investors, and the, the big problem right now for, I think, investors, you can raise your hands if this is true, is like capital capacity of startups. So like the big problem in our space is that there are not enough startups moving ahead making progress in interesting areas i think is that true investors like are you guys seeing interesting deals or do you want to see more yeah 
I mean, so I, I think you should, like entrepreneurs like, oh my God, how will I ever get money? I think, look at the space, get your vision together, get a good scalable capital plan together, get good people together, start talking. And you will, I think like, you know, there's just, you know, we may or may not need like 22 ex retail exchanges in the US, <laughs> I don't know. But, but um, there's, a, there's like a whole array of businesses waiting to be built. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. And, and one thing that I think investors are finding is a lack of investable companies to invest. That's exactly. true. There's now, more money than there are companies. A lot more. So, so I, I think what some investors are realizing is they're just going to do the business plan themselves because they that know what happening. to do. And then they go to events like this to try to figure out, okay, who am I gonna hire to build this? Yeah. So, so the investors are actually coming up with the plans now. Yeah. When's too soon, for because there's people out here that raise their hand, I want money, yeah. and, um, and they do. When is too soon for them to be asking? When sh what should they have in place before they go looking to the, uh, the VCs? You need a three-slide deck, and you can have your, well, with a VC, you need a lot. Mm -hmm. For an angel, you need a three-slide deck, and you just go talk talk to an angel. Make it one you don't really want his money. An angel's not <laughs> investing in your company, yeah. he's investing in you. So you have to go out there yeah, and, and you have no company at that point. It's your right. yeah, exactly it's your best friend. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be like someone that you're working with twenty four hours of the day. So they're not gonna look at they're gonna look at what your of course your business model is, but they're gonna look at you and how you are and if your morals and ethics are in line with them and if you guys can be bros and that's what it is. But I will say, I mean, when I say three slide deck, the you do have all this other work to do. Which What's is the three like, side slide deck? It's just like who we are, what the market opportunity is, how we're going to do Got it. it. Maybe four, how much money we we'll make. Throw some statistics in there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but you numbers. have to put the thought and time and recruiting energy and all those things in, into that, of course. But it's not hard to go start conversation with angels. I would say a working technical prototype of some kind. Here's, and Here's the Y Combinator man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's like, sure. product, product, product. Yo, no, seriously, though. I mean, I think um, I there, are, there are a lot of people. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> I'll give you a second if you'd like to <laughs> bust kidding. up a notebook. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, though, um, I think, uh, in essence, what a lot of um, investors are looking for is a strong technical background, and uh, that really shows, I think, I think there are a lot of people here with very ambitious ideas, but the reality is it needs to get built yeah. out, and you need a solid technical team in order to be able to do that. Um, and uh, you think about what an investor is looking for, they're evaluating a potential return against what the risk for that is. And that risk is greatly mitigated if there is a credible technical team they know is already behind it and can build it. So I would encourage people to at least have some kind of technical prototype that an investor can touch, look at, and say, hey, this is mm -hmm. actually real. Yeah, you go farther. So, One, go ahead. No, no, go for it. Uh, all I was going to say is since we're in fintech, you you're going to need like all these other things along with tech that you don't need for a lot of businesses too. So anyway, but co-founders, <clears throat> when you have like a team of two or three people where you guys like one person is, is super technical and one person is great at business, when the, when the roles and responsibilities are really kind of separated, I think investors like that a lot better because you're getting like two different people and you don't have to go out. If you're, if you're just a business guy and you have an idea and you have to go get developers, it's kind of harder. But if you start with a team with someone um, who is already super technical, then it's great. I've never actually met my co-founder. Gareth, you've Gareth, never, I've never met, him? met Gareth Nelson. You've never met the him. Guy who created Ben Instant. I no, would he's, never ever do that. He, <laughs> I mean, if you go, if you look how the company was started, there was a forum post of a guy Gareth Nelson on the forums and said, "I have this idea," and I was the first person to respond no, I, to it. And I applaud I said, your bravery. <laughs> he's, yes. He lives in the <laughs> It was the, uh, the multi-million dollar decision to, yeah, to respond to that Yeah, he lives in the post. UK and he's like super genius, he's uh, autistic and, and we've become like super amazing friends every single day working together and I was going to go out to London a few weeks ago to meet him and he's like, I don't want to meet you. Oh my God. Oh. Wow. <laughs> he's nervous. I'm nervous too though because we built this relationship over like the internet. This the is very romantic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can we do questions? <laughs> yeah, let's let's take some questions. I do not recommend that, folks. <laughs> no, I wouldn't recommend it either, by the way. Wow, it's a great story. I, I did don't not recommend know that. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. That's insane, <laughs> but kind of awesome. No, you should total yeah. Charlie. Charlie, Charlie I'm a that's really intense exactly, person. That's what's good about you, Charlie. I'm serious. I like that, yeah. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, you're in good company. I've actually I've actually built a company like that. One of my co-founders was in Maryland, and it was nine months before I realized I hadn't met him in person. <laughs> right? Because we talked over every day of Google to. Plus. Right, yeah. He was could have been in the next cubicle. I knew his personality and his <laughs> professionalism. But anyway, um, just on the angel subject, wanted to make everybody aware uh, the Bit Angel Group 
We'll be meeting for the first time at 12 o'clock over lunch in the left and backmost table. And we're just going to debrief like you guys are talking about. There's a lot of startups, and they need a lot of help to get up that level they of do. professionalism. Yeah. And so any angel investors interested, we're going to kind of debrief on all the companies we've talked about or talked to Who during the conference. Who could be an angel investor? Can you explain? Uh, basically, what's that? Who can be an angel investor? Can you explain? Well, it helps to be an accredited investor uh, in the what U.S. Does that for mean? Yeah, investment for those purposes. Who don't know. For those that don't know, you need a couple million dollars in assets, excluding your house under the current regulations. Um, or have so an like income 10 over bitcoins, basically. 10 bitcoins. Yeah, if you have if you if you have like 10 or more bitcoins, come and join the angel group, <laughs> bit angels, and we're gonna it'll be fun. But uh, but yeah, no, great input, and I agree with you guys. You know, um, that's what we need is what what we really need is not not even necessarily like you're saying the funding, but we need the social capital from the veteran entrepreneurs that have been through this time and time again and help can take these guys to the next level. So wow. thanks for what you're doing and uh, come check out Bit Angels. So we'll that's see amazing, you guys there. Yeah. dude. Peter, like how how amazing is it to see? I know totally all like investors and that's startups cool. in the Bitcoin space. It's so beautiful. How hard was it for the four of us to raise money? It was like. We, we, have this, we primed it for you guys. This is in Prague, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back two like, years ago. <laughs> I, I just remember I've, I've been to many a, a venture pitch. And like two years ago, they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then uh, starting a year ago, they'd be like, well, Frank says no. Can I talk to you privately? How do I buy some bitcoins? <laughs> 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 like I've been now in like 30 pitches like yeah. that where someone's like, I got to buy some bitcoins. I don't think we're going to fund this. but <laughs> Yeah, I think the environment is getting much better. I mean, even when we were starting to raise for our most recent round, it was three months ago and before sort of the recent media hype uh, really, really set in and the price accordingly exploded. Um, but there were two very different types of meetings. One was the venture capitalist already knew about Bitcoin and the question was, are you the right company to take it forward? Mm -hmm. The other type of meeting was, I don't know what Bitcoin is, and that was really a non-starter. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've just said now we're not going to educate your group about Bitcoin. Yeah. You've got to want it before we'll come talk to you. Yeah, Fred, sort of, was it hard for you and Brian to like, deal with white combinator uh, obstacles in, in, for Bitcoin because it was kind of like new? Um, no, I mean, I, I think you know, ju just as any sort of company ramps up, um, it, the earlier stage stuff is knowingly more risky and hopefully ambitious, and then sort of as you scale the company, the risk gets taken out. So that, that really wasn't too much of an issue. I would say the, the sort of what I'm trying to get at here is generally speaking, investors, for those trying to raise capital, um, uh, there are far fewer of them who fall into the camp of educate me about Bitcoin and then maybe we can talk about your company, um, yeah. which I think is a huge positive for the space. Yeah, it's true. There's just a ton. Of, uh, when you have a little bit of notoriety or people know that you know about it, you will be invited in to someone who's just going to, who's like, please educate me about everything about this space. Thank you very much. I'll, I wonder who I'll invest <laughs> in. You know. So these, yeah. these startup, the startup classes idea, I think Boost, Boost uh, Adam Draper is doing one, Lightspeed Ventures is doing one. Would you recommend a Bitcoin startup kind of go that route or try to do it on themselves? I'm talking about an accelerator. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think uh, generally speaking, the benefit of a program like that is a just being in an environment where you are with like-minded people who can really, you know, as, as you sort of said, like you want people around you, and it sounds like this is a yeah. great thing at the Bidinson's offices every day, who are extremely excited about what you're working on, and that helps everybody move forward. Um, the other thing that that sort of these programs can help with, and YC definitely helped us uh, in this regard, is. Um, it, it brings you connections, but it also gives a sort of initial stamp of approval, however mm -hmm. small that may be, so that, you know, especially given the space we're in, um, and it is finance related, that um, that's very important. It was as, big news when you guys got in, when Brian got in. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, and it really, um, you know, it, as we all need to sort of build out relationships in the traditional financial world, um, that takes trust uh, from people, specifically bankers uh, for, for a lot of us, um, mm -hmm. where their job is to be risk averse. Mm -hmm. um, so anything that can sort of get you started on the right foot um, when it comes to interacting with the traditional business or financial world, I think really helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important too. I mean, you have to look at the qualifications of your investors. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not taking money just for the reason to take money, right? You're letting them into your company because you want their expertise. You know, you want their help. And especially in the areas where we are, right? We're typically, you know, tech guys and we're doing financial services. And so we need people that are 
you know, experienced and knowledgeable and connected mm -hmm. into financial services. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we can do our job technically, it's just, you know, how do we help scale our company and, and get, you know, play nice with, I guess, the incumbents. Who We're Bitcoiners, yeah. so it's good to have investors that are like non-Bitcoiners who yeah, can like totally. look in. Yeah. Because it's very, very easy to get wrapped up in the hype and the passion of Bitcoin when you're up for three days straight reading about Bitcoin, <laughs> like when the, when the fork happened. <laughs> Like everyone was, it was so oh exciting. I had my popcorn and I was on the IRC <laughs> channel. Because <laughs> it's, it's so much fun to be part of something like that. Um, but it's good to have investors who are like slap you in the face and say, no, we got to focus on the long-term goal here and not the short term. And it's really important for that. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels, of course, with the Bitcoin world and, and the real world. So you want to get folks that, you know, know the real world business and bring them yeah. into the Bitcoin space. Yeah. It, Absolutely. It, it's also just, it's like social signaling to have people. It's like, oh, Ex investor, yes, I've I've made money with him before. He's a good guy. He's vetted as entrepreneurs, I'm sure, and those things will really help. You know, you've got to go do that work of getting vetted, but that will that will help you. Sure, and anytime you go through a Series A, you know, there's going to be a lot of due diligence involved. Mm -hmm. So once you complete that process, you know, anybody else, and really any banker, any lawyer that you're working with, you know, having completed that with a major, you know, VC firm like you guys did. Um, and like we did, just shows that you as a business have, you know, passed the due diligence, mm -hmm. right? And, then, and it gives, you know, people that you're doing business with a higher degree of confidence that these guys know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited that you guys raised congratulations, obviously, yeah. um, for, for this exact reason. I think it really forwards the entire space. And again, you know, we are sort of all straddling this, this, this um, area where we need to be connected to the traditional financial world. And we're obviously moving into what we feel uh, on the other side, could very well be the future of payments, um, but you need those. <laughs> you need you need those traditional Everybody take relationships, a drink. though, to, to move forward. Um, so I, I'm excited for all of us as, yeah. as a result yeah. of this stuff. Yeah. Let's take another question, if we, sir. Hi, my name is Marvin Rab. I live here in Silicon Valley. Congratulations what, to you, all. Right, right into the microphone, if you would, Marvin. How about that? Yeah, that'd Great. be awesome. Better. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marvin Rab. I live and work here in Silicon Valley. Congrats to all of you on your companies. Thanks. And uh, this definitely has like a dot com. Uh, bus, uh, boom, feel to it. <laughs> I keep hearing that. <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, we, there we, will we, be volatility, Martin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With the uh, rapid growth of your companies, how will you avoid the pitfalls of the dot com bubble? And are any of you taking management classes? <laughs> Ouch. No. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, See, for CEOs, ment mentoring is really important. I'm a long, long-time entrepreneur, and I'm constantly learning. And so, yes, I'm not taking classes. Yeah. I have no time, but I'm calling people I, I trust. I actually got a call. I think this is interesting. I had a, this is a career first for me. I got a call from a Wall Street hedge fund guy who's invested in Bitcoin when the price went up to 70, maybe 60, 50, 60. And he was like, please cool this market off for me. Because <laughs> he wanted to buy. And Well, and he, I said, explain to me in legal terms what you're talking about um, <clears throat> and he said you should put shorting in place because the market's like overheated and we're gonna have a big drop right and and, um, and I think like those questions are interesting for industry as a whole uh, you know I, ag I agree that there should be shorting so we can have a better conversation about price I think that would help um, that may be a rocky road once uh, we start getting large-scale structured shorting into the market um, we look at Bitcoin two different ways like you're more into Bitcoin as a currency when we look at, I guess, Tony, myself, and Coinbase, uh, Bitcoin is a payment infrastructure. Mm -hmm, it's like a mm -hmm. payment system. Yeah. So, like, the price to me, I don't even, I, we have the price up on our screen, of course, in the office, but... It's exciting. I, and I know the investors are checking the price, like, every five minutes of, of Bitcoin. Coinlab.com slash chart. We need to... Or slash uh, mobile. Nice. You need to not look at the price <laughs> every single minute, because you're into Bitcoin for the long haul, and it's not like a short-term thing. You tell anyone who wants to buy Bitcoin, a few words of advice, it's like, one, don't bet your house. Don't put any money that you can't be, uh, afford to lose. Totally. Don't borrow money, um, and don't look at the price every day, because this is like a stock of Coca-Cola that you're gonna buy for your kids. You know, it's just gonna... I look at the price every day. Right. Well, I mean, it's fun to look at the price yeah. every day. But it's no, like, oh, my net worth just went up. Yeah. Oh, my net worth just went wait, down by wait, 50 grand. I bet the house <laughs> I put on money, when I did all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, all right, we're getting Not champagne the tonight. You know? yeah. Well, if there's, if there's one thing we learned from the 90s, that the whole dot-com boom and bust, is that things just got way overhyped. You, you had investors throwing money at people with business plans with no business. That will happen. They were actually going public that will happen in this and case. having an IPO with no yeah. business. Well, that might not happen. So, you know, I think, I hope we've learned our lesson and I hope we don't repeat that, but, you know, what I would hope that we avoid is just too many investors throwing money at, at just sprinkling it around you know, trying to, to throw money at bad ideas just because they want to get into the space. Yeah. They're better off just buying Bitcoins 
you know, than trying to throw money at a, at a bad idea. Oh, I'd Tony, like to see is... good and like risky ideas funded. That's my that's yeah. my counterpoint to that because yeah. yeah, like we need more we need more innovation on the product and offering layer. Like there's so many people copying just a few bits infrastructure. Right now. Infrastructure yeah. is important. Yeah, I mean you, you can't build any you know fun thing on the peripheral if the infrastructure to isn't totally. Built. And that's what we're all doing this year. And, and, that's, that, and that's what that's what you see now is that investors are throwing money at a lot of peripheral things that none of us are going to work if the infrastructure isn't strong enough. But that's also important. Um, I mean, I was talking to to Adam Draper, and he, he's focusing a lot on more of the next wave mm -hmm. of Bitcoin companies. Totally. Like, they'll be ready to leverage the infrastructure we're building. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's, so that's, that's, that's really cool. important at yeah. the same time. Like, if you don't need to have an idea that's going to be involved in, like, the core infrastructure now, there, there are many waves of Bitcoin. It's not like... All, everyone's getting money now, and then the, the doors are going to close up, and no one else can get money. It's just going to continue. It's a rolling, you know, like a rolling reserve or whatever. We've got to establish Bitcoin in 2013 so that we can have the future of payments. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Question. Uh, hi, my name's Masuri Clark. I'm an investor. Um, Welcome. Thank you. Um, and We're all way, happy to see you. I check the price every 30 seconds. It's just a game I like. I can't help it. My, my kids do the same thing. <laughs> I'm surprised they don't have it up on the chart yeah. here. Yeah, Roger, <laughs> Roger Veer in, 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 in all of Roger's houses, he has like, um, uh, like a beep uh, when the price goes up. It's like ding. And then when the price is down, like a uh, Classic Roger. So when you're on the yeah. phone with Roger, it on the alerts. phone with him or on Skype or anything related to that, or like at his house, you'll hear it like ping. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, what is that? <laughs> He's like, All that's, over. It's like that's my personal it. emotional health, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Feel bad for his wife. <laughs> anyway, I did have a question. Uh, <laughs> I want to bring up kind of what I think is an elephant in the room in investing is, um, and I've talked to a few of the VCs, and none of them have ever heard of ASIC Miner. And what are your thoughts on the alternate routes of funding that Bitcoin has opened up? That you know, ASIC Miner is the story. You know, they started in September raised about $500,000 worth of Bitcoins and GLBSE, and their market cap today is $100 million. <laughs> and that's a hell of a funding. <clears throat> uh, Who's this? And, uh, ASIC Miner. ASIC Miner. Which ASIC company? They, they're it's, ASIC called ASIC Miner. Miner. it's called yeah. ASIC Miner. It's called ASIC Miner. Yeah, and yeah they, were, they, they were the first today, to market with the chips. Yeah, they're, they're capped well, at $100 million today on well, GLBSE. On, is GLBSE still running? No. What? No, no, but James the shares, down, the shares right? now are sold private. They're still tracked. They're still they're like through MPEX. MPEX. People use MPEX yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, continue. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're asking, like, why not just buy Bitcoin? Well, not just buy Bitcoin, yeah. but for investors um, that maybe even want to get a jump on angels and VCs, it seems there's like Bitfunder and these other sources of raising funds that ASIC Miner has proven to be quite successful if done properly. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So I have told uh, every investor I've talked to in the space, I think the right play is get long Bitcoin somehow and then make strategic bets. Yes, I've done that part. Good work, good work, my friend. Um, and then, you know, once, it's actually, it's very different than most finance, like, plays that are made, because once you're long Bitcoin, your investment decision-making changes, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, like, what's, what's most important infrastructure needs to be built? I, yeah, I can, I can put money in, it might make money, it might not. If the infrastructure works, I'm happy, because I've got this over here. Um, so I, th I, think the, I think the investment dynamics are unusual. That's something funds are worrying about now. They can't buy coins in the fund. Um, so these are, these are things investors are thinking about as well. Well, I, I kind of mean more, since you guys are the entrepreneurs, for potential entrepreneurs out here. Obviously, me as an investor, I can look at any of those avenues. But for somebody, what would you say to somebody, instead of trying to talk to these VCs all the time or angel investors, of looking at these alternate sources for funding their companies? Mm -hmm. Whatever works for you. Yeah. you talk, I wish we had Yifu up here. Yifu from Avalon ASIC, like he's sold millions of dollars worth of ASICs already, but he hates investors. He won't let anyone, anyone invest in his company. And that's what makes investors want to invest more. But he's gone, <laughs> he's gone like the, pr I told you, it's like dating, play hard to get, but he, um, which is, I'm not very good at, anyways. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he doesn't, he like, he tells me all the time, I and mean, he, he went the pre-order route, like he set up pre-orders, um, and then he used that money to, to get the, the first batch out, and then he used the next money to get the next batch out. It doesn't work for all business models, but like, if it does work for you, you should definitely explore every single option before you make a decision. Like, don't go the note route, don't go the, this series or angel or whatever route or accelerator before you've really seen the whole playing field and whatever works for you. On a personal level too, like some people can't, can't like physically work with investors. It's it's really hard. You have to allow this person to come into your life and and like 
not tell you what to do, but guide you in a way. But they, they have good intentions. But it, when you're in the thick and thin of it, it can be very overwhelming and stressful. Yeah. And, and there's new alternative ways to raise money. I mean, crowdfunding is huge nowadays. And you Legal guys now, raised, too. Yeah, you guys raised some through, through crowdfunding. And I, I think that's a much, a much more open way to do things. Um, in our state of Georgia, actually, they, they passed a law now where if you are a Georgia resident and you want to invest in a Georgia company, you can invest up to $1,000 and you don't have to be an accredited investor. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that's going to open it up to you know, a lot of crowdfunding, a lot of innovation, so that you may not have to go the traditional you know, angel round, VC round. You might be able to get crowdfunding. And when you do that, you, know, you, you are in more control. Of, of running your company, right? Because these guys as a group, you know, all kind of invest in an LLC and that LLC takes a share. But, you know, you may have 100 people that are invested in you, but they only have one entity and one voice. Huh. And so for somebody like Gifu, I mean, he, he was able to fund his company a different way. But I, I think crowdfunding is going to be the future of the software industry. You know, people are going to want software <laughs> built. And Steve and I talk about this all the time, that, you know, anybody that has a, a vested interest in having it built will fund it. But then when it's done, it's going to be open source for everybody to be able to use. So again, the Kickstarter model, or, or again, the, the one that you guys used, I think is, is a great opportunity to have an alternate way to raise money. Yeah, uh, the only other thing I would add to that too, I think I touched on this briefly before, is um, th there are two important things in taking investors. One is you're getting capital. The second is you're getting guidance. Um, so I would, I would just say uh, specifically to the model that, that was spoken to, or crowdfunding, or Bitcoin crowdfunding, whatever it may be, um, that, that you just make sure that you have the guys behind you who you feel like um, will help you advance your business and w whatever that may be. It may be traditional financial world connections, maybe technical expertise, whatever, whatever it is. Hi, my name is JR. I'm a software developer. Uh, I might someday want a Bitcoin related software job. And I was wondering if you would talk to people like me uh, who might someday want a Bitcoin job without saying, you can't say, come talk to me because that's cheating. How like, would you position yourself to get noticed by companies that are in early stages that are hiring? Uh, I mean, is it enough to put, I love Bitcoin on, on your LinkedIn profile? You're hired. And then wait. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, are, there aren't enough developers in the Bitcoin. Like, we need more. We need, and all uh, of we us need, are hiring yeah, developers. We need, yeah, we need more engineers. Like now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you put, I love Bitcoin on your LinkedIn profile, say somebody who's watching this on video at home, uh, are, you, are your recruiters going to find them? I mean, no, you've got to go make a good pitch to come work for a company. Culture, yeah. I mean, yeah. culture gotta, matters, education matters, experience matters, your GitHub pushes matter. All those things matter. We're looking for you, yeah. but you have to make yourself notice. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So as a software developer, I want to see what you can do. Yeah. Like if you have something that you have wrote, just, it might even be simple, push this button, makes this little guy jump on the screen. I want to see what you can do. One thing in our space, there's so much work to be done on core, like open source even infrastructure. You know, we love people who, like we love like the Jeff Garzik's of the world, who's I think with Tony now. Thank yeah. you, Tony, for paying Jeff to work on Bitcoin. Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like, uh, those, those guys are great from CoinLab's point of view, and you can look at their code, see how good it is. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot to be, there's a lot of work to be done to bring up a traditional software engineer into a, like Bitcoin land. It's nice to not have to do that. Yeah and, then, yeah, and then you have to hang on to them because you're training someone and they become like a Bitcoiner developer. Um, you don't want to lose them. But and then they bought ASIC miner shares and yeah. then they bought an island apparently. <laughs> but if you're going <laughs> to yeah. if you're going to open source your software, make sure the API key isn't still in the code. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Patrick and Donald are you listening to this? <laughs> yeah. <It's up. laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Lars. I'm from from Norway. Welcome. I'm an entrepreneur myself. Cool. Um, I, I also I'm a student. I'm, I'm fourth year now in my PhD in entrepreneurship. I specialize in so social entrepreneurship, and I've, I've created a, a social venture. It's called Nevara. It's an urban farming platform, mm -hmm. and we're interested in bitcoins for three reasons. Um, one, one is to for crowdsourcing to kind of like pay people who gets involved in crowdsourcing. The second is uh, the crowdfunding thing we're we're doing. Um, it's like how people can pay with. Bitcoin so to support um, a local project in a local community. Um, but my question relates more to, to um, the concept we built in the, the loyalty rewards space for like uh, accepting payments in Bitcoins on, on farmers markets. So we're focused mm -hmm. on 
as an urban farming platform, we focused on urban farmers and farmers markets. Farmers should take Bitcoin. Right. So, I think so. so th what I'm like getting to is that um, we're of course we, we're, our main focus is on ACH transfers, like directly to your checking account. But then we also want to uh, enable them the option of accepting bitcoins, and we want to make the, the pitch to them. And if you accept bitcoins. Um, you can actually give a discount and still make money in the long run. So if you keep bitcoins, the value is expected to appreciate compared to the dollar, because the, the Fed is like <clears throat> has engaged in unlimited printing of dollars. Of course, we're just going to drive down the real value of dollars, while the bitcoin, as we all know, has an absolute limit to how many is, is ever going to go on the market, which in the long run is going to drive up the value. So I was just wondering what, what the panel thinks about uh, the future value of Bitcoin compared to dollars. I, I would say the value prop to any merchant, and farmers certainly fall into that category, uh, should be more around what's your, and any business can, can relate to this, what's your current cost of processing payments? Um, say you're accepting PayPal or credit cards on the internet, whatever, it's roughly 3%. Um, how would you like to pay 1%? As, and I think what, what Tony and I are both trying to do here is really um, make, you know, make businesses more efficient in, in that way. The whole uh, fluctuation in the currency, I see as um, something, at least at the moment, that sort of should be abstracted away from a lot of merchants. Um, and I believe Tony and myself both do this through allowing um, any merchant to instantly lock in the exchange rate so they know what fiat amount they're getting out the back end. Because if you're a farmer and all of a sudden, uh, you know, you sold a bunch of your fruit uh, when Bitcoin was worth $255, you might be shutting down the farm if, uh, <laughs> if all of a sudden you held on to those um, a couple days later, yeah, you might not be so happy. So I, I think it's going to sort of be an easing in process where um, the direct and very tangible value is you are saving 2% on your bottom line and all that stuff hopefully will come in later as the currency stabilizes, which is sort of the economic underpinning if, stakeholder. If you have 10% margin, that's a lot yeah, more profit. Exactly. So as, yeah. Yeah, as, as a percentage of profit, especially if you're a, let's say you're a 5% margin business, you're saving 2% on, uh, on the payment processing costs. All of a sudden, that's 40% to your, to, your, uh, to your bottom line. Yeah, I think yeah, that I mean, you yeah. can pitch to your, um, the, the farmer, the, you should pitch to the farmer that the customer gives more options to buy rather than trying to put the farmer into the speculative current, currency industry and then you're asking them to, besides growing fruits and vegetables and raising pigs, now I want you to be a currency speculator too and that's a, that, that can be a lot for a person to internalize. I'm the other way, man. If I were a farmer, I would sell for fiat whatever I needed to live and then I would sell all the rest for Bitcoin. Like, that would be awesome. If like, you can get have it. you guys been to Vermont? I mean, like those guys all own their farms. They don't have debt. They're like, <laughs> they they can afford all this like very nice. Anyway, I don't know. That's yeah, what it's like. But I'm not a farmer, <laughs> just to be clear. Yeah, and the other thing is is you know they don't. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Yeah. Right. You know, if Bitcoin is just a small percentage of the sales that they bring in the door, then they can just keep it all in Bitcoin. Yeah. But if if they're selling and doing a lot of business with Bitcoin, you yeah. know, then maybe they yeah. want to just heavy. keep 10 yeah. percent right in Bitcoin or whatever they need to do. Um, because yeah, I mean, every farmer does not want to be an online currency trader, right? That's not their business, mm -hmm. you know, but they just want to run their farm and make money mm -hmm. in the lowest cost and most efficient way. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Hey, I'm uh, John Russell. I'm a software engineer. I'm actually the uh, technical co-founder of the RoboCoin kiosk, which is just sitting over in the other room. And I mean, I've learned a lot this weekend and I was wondering, um, the kind of the uncertainty of the regulatory landscape in the future. Um, how has that affected, uh, you know, seeking investment, talking to investors, um, you know, talking to other people who may want to work, um, customers, I guess. I mean, how, how do you guys, how, how, have, how have you guys been dealing with that, um, with just this total uncertainty of the future? I, I don't think it's that uncertain anymore. If, if you go to the regulatory panels, they're like, you're going to have to get your licenses. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, they, basically, know your they basically came out and said Bitcoin is money. And once they yeah. said that, now you have to look at the process because every single one of mm -hmm. our businesses is different, right? Uh, an exchange is different from you know, a banking service, which is different from a payment processor. So now you have to judge yourself based on the service, right? And if, you're ha if you have a vending machine, um, you know, that's going to be different than being a currency exchange. So you have to define exactly what process you have you know, and then work with your attorneys and go from there. I'd say get, a, get good lawyers who really, really care about your company and want to be into the long run, develop a funds flow model, 
understand exactly every single word, how the dollar goes in and how it goes out or whatever you're doing. Yeah. Understand your, your regulatory position. Understand a legal framework for your company to legally exist. If you're going to be running a company in the United States, as much as you hate the laws and the rules or whatever and all the, the, the money transmission, money service businesses, you've got to know your customer. That's yeah. the most important thing at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Marcy. I'm with BitInstant, actually. I have is this a setup question? This oh. is not a softball question. I look forward to the astroturfing. Oh. Come, Marcy. Come, Marcy. Sally doesn't have to answer. What do you um, like about BitInstant? <laughs> BitInstant is great. Yeah. No, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs at the conference, a lot of people talking about doing new things. One of the things I've personally noticed is that there seem to be a lot of people talking about doing the same thing. Yeah. So a lot of exchanges out there. Yeah. You know, how would you guys advise people on how to look to the next level instead of just, you know, trying to do kind of the same ideas right now to grab the VC funding that's coming in? Yeah. Like, what's yeah. the next level and looking down the road for what entrepreneurship might mean in the Bitcoin community? I've been thinking about this for a while, and it, like, we all have moral hazard. It's like, don't do a wallet provider, a merchant service, <laughs> or an exchange, or, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> But seriously, don't do an exchange. <laughs> yeah, on, there's so, so many exchanges. No, really, don't do an exchange. <laughs> exchange is the hardest thing to open up. So, but, yeah, but there's so many ones doing it now. Like their as, mother. As, on the, as a foundation, the foundation had, I've been thinking for a while, like I really want to see more creativity out there in terms of business models. Um, and and th there are some known mostly working financial models out in the space. We're kind of all inventing them as we go. Great. Um, there's room for lots of players and all those in, 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 in some circumstances at the very least. So, but I, you know, I, I think like what Charlie and I were saying about Adam, funding kind of like next generation consumer product whatever these whatever the next cool stuff, stuff is do that stuff yeah the it's, bitcoin atm know. is so cool yeah oh that. my god i've given them so much money <laughs> <laughs> like um, all of these products they're yeah. they're amazing so what's going to happen in a year is like between now and next year this conference some totally new idea will have like made someone you know 50 million dollars mm -hmm. and then we'll see we'll see like 10 of those me too's Coming along, so I, like you know, think hard and 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 creatively. That's my pitch. Yeah, it's, um, yeah you you have to differentiate yourself. You know, you you can't be a me too product, like you said. And and I think probably one of the most innovative things we've seen so we're far. We're launching in the a merchant Bitcoin services is, company. Yeah, no, just kidding. Yeah, don't don't do that either. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the most creative things that Coinbase we've actually lab. seen. <laughs> yeah, Coinbase Lab. Yeah, bit instant pay. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good one, Marcy. By yeah, actually, yeah, all yeah, have been we <laughs> 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 yeah. So we're we're gonna get we're gonna get all the bit companies against all the coin oh companies. Oh my god. <laughs> We we'll have, have a like, a, like a soccer match, like or Royal something. Rumble, you know. Right. Coin, Coinfund.com, it's coming. <laughs> Coin um, yeah, no, but you you have to. I I think one of the most innovative things you know that you get you know by being creative and thinking outside the box is what Vinny at Gift did, mm -hmm. like in the yeah. last week. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, he just opened up Bitcoin into fifty thousand retail locations that we all use, and that that's the whole point of having a currency is it's valuable because you can actually use it and spend it, right? It's not just a day trading instrument anymore. You can actually use it for something. So I think you know by by thinking outside the box, you know, you have a hundred companies right now that are trying to build mobile wallets, mm -hmm. right? All the tech companies are doing, all the banks are doing it, mm -hmm. all the telecoms are doing it, you know, the retailers themselves you call, like, are doing it. Like money twenty twenty, and you right? see like a whole row of like Square, Stripe, yeah. people comes out with their thing called stand. I'm surprised there's no circle triangle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Could you come up with different things yeah. like shapes? Yeah, but the problem is, you know, there are a hundred of them. Every single one of them has the same two problems. Yeah. Number one, none of them talk to each other. They're all walled gardens. And number two, none of them work internationally. Mm -hmm. So I can have all 10 apps on my phone. If I go to London, none of them are going to work. Yeah. Right, and so I, I think you have to think outside the box, and, and, and this gives a lot of Bitcoiners an advantage because we're coming to it with a fresh set of eyes mm -hmm. that the traditional banks and, and the technology companies are not doing. So creativity is important, but you've got to come up with something unique you know, that can differentiate yourself. Um, I, I just don't see a whole lot of investors excited about a Me Too product. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do just like Mt. Gox does, but change this one thing. Okay, well. If yeah, I got an I email for everyone you, opening up that. an exchange like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think. I think people who are out there thinking about building a Bitcoin idea should really follow the old adage of don't build the company for how the world is now. In this case, uh, at the moment, I think that would mean building an exchange. So seriously, don't build an exchange. Um, build, build or a merchant service. Yeah. <laughs> build a, uh, thanks for that. Build a, uh, you know, build a company for how, how you see the world in five years. And uh, I think in the Bitcoin space right now, um, that means looking at how Bitcoin can solve major pain points uh, in the global economy. One thing would be build an SMS-based service, as simple as that is, so that when a second or third world country has a major inflationary spiral, they can reasonably use Bitcoin. 
build a paywall app. Everybody's That's a great to, idea. The paywall app yeah. is a great. Yeah. Someone should do that, like, yeah. and pitch it to Wall Street. I actually Journal. have somebody building one in the hackathon next door, so That's hopefully that'll be awesome. That's, Go check it I'll out. Introduce cool. them to every um, every news company. They all. Yeah. It's a great idea. I've been saying it. Like, instead of having to pay twelve dollars a month, if you could pay one, you know, one Satoshi or whatever to, to read an article, people will do that. Exactly. I mean, think about a remittance company. So Zoom IPO'd not too long ago. Yep. People are getting their proverbial faces ripped off in, uh, in, in fees and in, in remittance payments. Um, and that's a massive industry that Bitcoin, I think, can bring great, uh, great efficiencies to. So think about where those real pain points are uh, for real people and try to build something around that. Donations. Exactly, yeah. Look at a company like Flatter. They had a really good run-up. Um, for those who don't know what Flatter is, Flatter is a company that allows you to like, buy these Flatter credits and then if you go on like YouTube or, or watch a video you can give someone kind of like a, a micro donation but it's it's not international and you have to buy the flatter credit so it didn't really take off but if you do it well it is taking off I don't know um, if you're if you're if you're doing that through Bitcoin it's a great idea because it's you're, you're yeah. an international faster yeah. and, easier. And, it, and it opens up a whole new market when you look at let's say just the copyright industry you know the reason why a song on iTunes is a dollar twenty nine is that it costs Apple thirty cents just to process that and then when you take out all the you know, people in the middle, right, the, the record label, the distributor, the artist only actually gets about 10 cents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with Bitcoin, you cut out everybody in the middle. An <laughs> artist can sell that product on their own website for 15 cents. And people will probably buy it. Because if I'm a shopper, I'm probably more than willing to just click the button and download the item for 15 cents than waste the time trying to go on, on a torrent and find it for free, right? It's not worth my time. I'm just going to pay the 15 cents. So the artist actually will get more legitimate sales and make more money by selling their content, you know, one piece at a time for Bitcoin. That's an important point, though, is that you can really use Bitcoin for something for something for the better. And we saw that in a lot of uh, early early protocols like voice over IP or even the way you, you know peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. In the beginning, it was all illegal downloading. It was people using LimeWire and Napster and Kazaa. But now, um, you come look at a company like uh, um, Spotify. Spotify uses all of the same technology that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, was built on. So when you're listening to a song on Spotify, you're more like 90% of the time you're listening to it from someone else's computer, not from Spotify central servers. And if you look now, 30% of torrent downloads are legal purchased downloads. So you're, when you have technology and, and protocol early on, of course, the ones who need to use it the most are the, the negative. They're going to come into it and it's going to be kind of a wild west. But as long as guys like us, investors, startups, entrepreneurs kind of weed them out and build new products and new infrastructure to make the world a better place, I think we're all purists at the end of the day. We just all want Bitcoin to help change the world. Last question. Um, in addition to the, uh, the more formal hackathon that you have, might it be possible in future conferences to have a rump session as well? I personally have been writing uh, ideas in my notebook that I did not bring here. Mm -hmm. I guess that's my Austrian economics training. I brought the conversation <laughs> created knowledge. A what session? A rump session where basically I could get up in front of some people and I could, you give me like like five minutes or, or mm -hmm. something like that and I, and I pitch an idea and then that guy behind me does the same thing. We, we, we actually have lightning talks at this conference. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. You Great idea. idea. <laughs> but yeah. I love it. It's in a room. Okay. Wow, you already that. did it. It's amazing. Yeah. I thought you asked ask and you will receive. Yeah. Yeah, you wanted a rum, rum session, like drinking rum. I didn't hear what you no, said. No, no, rum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rum yeah, session. Yeah. I, I agree. I, one of the, I haven't said much publicly about the conference other than, oh my God, this is awesome. Yeah, but, and it is. Um, I mean, I think next year we'll do it during the week and longer so that there's more time for stuff like that. I mean, I've gotten to like a quarter of the sessions I wanted to. So mm -hmm. um, how nice yeah. is that? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. So but having, problems to have. Yeah, yeah. Having, having something like a pitch session where entrepreneurs can sign up and you have 60 seconds yeah. in yeah. front of a microphone a yeah. to talk and then you give your pitch and then the next guy comes in line, right? And also encourage um, it to be where you get cat calls and stuff like that. Like, just, because everybody's very polite here. What you want is people throwing popcorn at you. To yeah. <laughs> Tomatoes. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can give like noisemakers or something where it's like a crumpled yeah, chocolate Bitcoin wrappers. There you go. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the way, how many people have signed up? Um, I'm only going to lie if I give you a number. Is Lindsay here? Lindsay's here. 1,102. Okay. Yeah. By the way, the, nice. I just want to let everyone know that the, the foundation board does nothing. We just vote on things. Lindsay's the one who did everything here. Yeah. So let's Lindsay. give her a round of applause. <laughs> She bought it's ASIC miner shares, done. so you can't hire her away. It's not the work done here. It's the work done in advance, and Lindsay did it all. Yeah, right. Everybody, thank you for yeah, coming to the so. panel. It is uh, lunchtime, I assume. Yes. So, uh, yes.